My Lord has garments so wondrous fine, and myrrh their texture fills. Its fragrance streams to this heart of mine, with joy my being thrills. Out of the ivory palaces, into a world of woe, only His great eternal Savior go. His life had also its sorrow sore, for Allos had a par. And when I think of the cross he bore, my eyes with teardrop star. Out of the ivory palaces, into a world of woe, only His great eternal Savior go. His garments too were in Casia dip with healing in a touch. Each time my feet in some sin have slid, he took me from its clutch. Out of the ivory palaces, into a world of woe, only His great eternal Savior go. In garments glorious He will come to open wide the door, and I shall enter my heavenly home to dwell forever. Palaces into a world of woe. Only his great eternal love made my Savior go. See you back again tonight as we study the word together. Uh, I might make a comment on that uh, Ivory Palaces hymn, Greg. I think you'll go a long way before you'll find a more lovely melody than that. It's based on the Finnish national anthem and it was written by Jean Sibelius, who was a president of Finland. And it's certainly a a, a melody that's very popular on our side of the fish pond. <coughs> now, I didn't ask Greg to choose any hymns or songs for me tonight, but I, even if I had, I don't think he could have done much better with the, the one that he chose, Out of the Ivory Palaces. 
it's, if you look at the song you see that right at the top of the page it says it's based upon Philippians 2 and you know the passage let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who existing in the form the morphe the essence of God did not think it a thing to be held on to to be equal with God but emptied himself took upon himself a form of a servant being found in fashion in the in the transient the passing fashion of a man humbled himself even to the death of the cross wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him not a name but given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess him Lord to the glory of God the Father I could have used that as the text because it really lines up with what I have as a text tonight and that's Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 which says in the fullness of time God sent forth his son born of woman born under the law to redeem them that were under the law the world is very soon going to be celebrating what it considers to be the birthday of Jesus for the coming of the, the Lord Jesus into the world was really the end of a tremendous plan that God had formed even before the world was created. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10, Paul speaks of a plan for the fullness of time. Now, God had a plan right at the beginning. As I said this morning when I spoke about uh, the, the Lord's words on the cross, in Genesis 3.15, when sin had been committed, God announced the first stage of that plan. He revealed the first little bit of it when he said that the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head. And through the Old Testament and on into the New, we see the development of that plan. As one of the prophets says, here a little, there a little, precept upon precept, line upon line, God revealed the plan until in the fullness of time, God sent forth the, well, sent out, ex apostolo, sent out his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. And, and that's, an, a, 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 that's a wonderful thought, really, that when Jesus came, he came at the right moment in the plan of God. He came at the moment which God had planned from before eternal ages. It's a stupendous thought, really, when you come to grapple with it. It's something that's really beyond our comprehension. How God worked through the ages until finally Jesus came into the world in the fullness of time. Now there are two words that are used. I don't want to use too many Greek words, but you can forget this in just a minute. There are two Greek words that are used for time. One is the word kairos. And that means one event following another. One, well, we, don't we sometimes teach our, our children about the dispensation, the, the patriarchal dispensation, the mosaic dispensation, the Christian dispensation, you know, the, the mosaic age, and so we go on. We speak of the great ages, the great dispensations of the Bible. That's the word kairos, one period following another. But there's another word that's used in the Greek language for time, and it's the word chronos. Now, that's a word that gives you the word uh, chronology. The people who have expensive watches don't have watches, they have chronometers. Because their watches are more precise than my Seiko or something like that, you see. At least that's what they think anyway. But that's really the expensive word for watch, a chronometer, a measure of time. And it means one moment following another, one minute following another, a, in the fullness of time, moments, minutes, hours, days, weeks, years, the succession of time. And ultimately, when the very right moment came, God sent out His Son. So what I'm suggesting tonight is that the coming of Jesus into the world was chronologically at the right time. And as I say, uh, God had this tremendous plan. Uh, oh, well, you know, what happened in Bethlehem almost 2,000 years ago wasn't just a chance event. It wasn't something that happened without any planning. 
but it happened at the precise moment for which God had planned. Uh, Jesus confirms that when he says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 3, Tit uh, Paul speaks of the eternal life which God promised in his word and was manifested at the proper time. And the word time there is that word for moment, manifested at the proper moment. Born of woman, not born of a woman. If you say born of a woman, you're perhaps thinking of the virgin birth that I mentioned this morning. It's the seed of the woman and not the seed of man that Genesis 3.15 concentrates. Because the birth of Jesus was a miraculous birth, born of the Holy Spirit. That's what Mary was told. Uh, that holy thing that shall, come, uh, that shall be born of thee is conceived by the Spirit. So Jesus was not simply born of a woman. He was born of woman. When you say Jesus was born of a woman, you're emphasizing his deity. The fact that he was divine, that he was the divine Son of God. But when you say Jesus was born of woman, woman, you're emphasizing his humanity. If you say that Jesus was divine, you're emphasizing the difference between him and us. When you say that Jesus was born of woman, you're emphasizing the fact that he had a, a birth similar to ours, that he shared human nature, that he identifies himself with us. It speaks of his solidarity with us as a human being. And born under law, not under the law. He's not talking about the law of Moses here, you know. If Jesus was simply born under the law of Moses to redeem those who were under the law of Moses, that would cut you and me out. Because we were never under the law of Moses. But Jesus was under law, just as Adam was under law right at the very beginning. When God said, you must not eat of that tree, that was a law. Adam was under law. And every human being that's ever born is born subject to law. And God requires obedience. So what Paul is actually telling us, that Jesus shared our humanity, he was born subject to law as we are, but whilst we, you and I are disobedient, Jesus was never disobedient. That's the amazing thing. He kept the law. He was always obedient to his Father. And because Jesus redeems those under law, that includes you and me. You and I can be redeemed by Jesus. Now let's think about this, that this was chronologically the right moment. But also, it was religiously the right moment. Religiously, the time was right for Jesus to come into the world. Now I think I've mentioned before that the word religion comes from re in Latin, which means uh, again, and ligo, I bind. So religion is a binding again, a binding back. Religion is that which binds a man back to God. And you know, there's not a verse in the Bible that says that God needs to be reconciled to man. But there are many verses that say that men must be reconciled to God. And the Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So religion is that which binds a man back to God. That's why we say that right at the very beginning, Adam didn't have a religion. He didn't need a religion. He didn't need, when he was created, to be bound back to God. Because he had full and free access to God. He was in harmony with God. He was at one with God. So, it is a religious purpose that God had when Jesus came into the world. And that religious purpose involved the choice of a people, the choice of a nation. Now that brings in the, the choice of Abraham way back in the beginning, some 1900 years before Jesus came into the world, God chose a man. He chose a man, strange to say, in Mesopotamia. Uh, if you turn to Joshua chapter 24 and verse 2, you'll find that Joshua there tells the people speaking for God, 
He says, your fathers worshipped other gods on the other side of the river. The river was the river Euphrates. As a matter of fact, the word Hebrew comes from Eber. Eber was one of the forefathers of Abraham. And the name Eber means the man who crossed over. So the Hebrews began actually in Mesopotamia. And they crossed over the river Mesopotamia and they came into the land of Canaan. So God chose this man called Abram in the beginning. Uh, How Abram came to know God in Mesopotamia where Joshua says that your fathers worship many gods, I don't know. I don't care very much. I'm only concerned that God found Abram. And God chose that man. He must have been a man of faith even then. And from that man, well, God gave him seven promises. If you want to go through the book of Genesis, beginning about chapter 12, God made him seven promises, three of which were most important. First of all, God promised him a people. He said, I'll make of you a great nation. And secondly, he promised him a homeland. And thirdly, he promised that through him there would be a universal blessing. Now then, think about this. Uh, The Jews were very proud to say we have Abraham to our father. And they were very proud to say that they were the people of God because of Abraham. But you know, if you have to go to the Old Testament history and you look at the things that happened to the Jews or to the the Israelites and the Hebrews in the Old Testament, you you, you might be forgiven for thinking that something had gone wrong with God's plan. (laughs) Because, well, before long they were in the land of Egypt. And you see them as slaves to Pharaoh. And then later on you see ten tribes going into captivity into Assyria. And then later on you see, 150 years later, you see uh, uh, the the kingdom of Judah going into captivity in, in Babylon. And time and time again they're overrun by their enemies. And God has to redeem them. Think of the period of the judges. The number of enemies they had then. And you say, well what's gone wrong if these are the people of God? Why is God allowing this to happen to them? That's exactly what the Jews thought. Uh, they, they, they said, for example, in, I think it's uh, Psalm 137, By the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion, because there those who wasted us required of us mirth, and said, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And they cried, O Lord God, why doth thine anger smolder against the sheep of thy pasture? Why is this happening to us? And when you think of the captivity in Babylon and the captivity in Assyria and the captivity in Egypt, you might say, well, well, it really wasn't working out very well. Ah, But it was. It really was. It was not simply that these people were being punished for their sin when God allowed them to go into Egypt. Remember, God said to Abraham, I'll make a great nation of you. Your children are going to be as numerous as the stars of the sky or as the sand on the seashore. You just can't count them. But I'll tell you this. If the children of Israel, the sons of Jacob, had just been shepherds wandering around the land of Canaan, following the flocks all the time, looking for new pasture, they never would have grown to be the great nation that God had in mind. Why, in the whole course of history... A nation has never developed in that way. No, if the sons of Jacob were going to be the great nation that God had in mind, they had to have the time to develop. They had to have the right environment, the right circumstances, the right location. And Joseph recognized that because Joseph told his brethren later, God sent me ahead of you to to preserve life, to make things ready for you. So that when 70 descendants of Jacob went into the, well, the family of Jacob consisting of 70 people, let me put it like that, went into the land of Egypt, they went to the land of Goshen, the most fertile part of Egypt, and bear in mind that Egypt was the breadbasket of the world at the time. Why, that was the, the, the ideal environment for them to grow and to develop. And that's why if you read Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7, you discover that they were fruitful and they increased greatly. They multiplied and grew and became strong and the land was filled with them. 
Now this is why God allowed them to go to Egypt. They needed to be stable for a time. They needed to be settled for a time. That they might grow to be a great people. And when you think about this, they multiplied. Not that they added, but they multiplied and became very strong. Now, if you had been living in the greatest country in the world of its time, a country that had three harvests a year provided by the river Nile, a country that was rich in every possible way, the envy of the rest of the world, and you were living in one of the choicest parts of the land, would you have willingly left it? Of course you wouldn't. And that is why God allowed another Pharaoh to come, who Exodus chapter 1 tells us did not know Joseph. That doesn't mean he'd never heard about Joseph. That may be true, but I don't think it is. I think it means that he had no regard for what Joseph had done for Egypt. He didn't care about Joseph. And he was afraid of the great numbers of, of, of Israelites. And consequently, he made them slaves. He made the people willing to come out when God sent Moses. You know, our politicians today would say that in the best part of Egypt, the Israelites never had it so good. And if God had not made them want to leave, well, Moses talks about that in a beautiful way. Uh, Moses says that, that as an eagle flutters over her nest and stirs up her young, that's how God made his people come out of Egypt. And can you imagine that? <clears throat> Here are these little, little eaglets in the nest, and they don't want to leave. But they've got to learn to fly. So what does the mother bird do? She hovers over their nest, over the nest, and she beats her wings. She creates this turb she creates turbulence. She disturbs the air and forcefully or forcibly is the better word, forcibly she ejects them from the nest so that they're forced to fly. Well that's how God got his people out of Egypt. Egypt played a part in God's plan because once the great nation was created God had to move on to the second stage in his promise he had well he'd full, he, he had to give them the land he fulfilled the first bit he promised Abraham a son and now he's promised him a nation and now he has to promise he has to fulfill the promise of a land to get them to the land of Canaan and they would never have left but for the persecution. Uh, and you know, it, it's really the same thing when you think of the captivity in Babylon. That was a terrible experience for the Jews, you know. Nebuchadnezzar three times invaded their country. He left it devastated, the walls of the city broken down, the temple ravaged, uh, uh, all the golden vessels taken away. That's what the Bible tells you. Uh, uh, many of the, of the nobility killed so they couldn't start another revolution leaving only the very poorest in the land who were not likely to rise up against the oppressor and they were told they were going to be 70 years in the land of Babylon and can't you imagine the people in Babylon well if we're the people of God why is this happening to us? but you know the, the captivity in Babylon served a tremendous purpose it had far-reaching consequences and it produced three vitally important results. Number one, it is a fact that after the captivity in Babylon, the Jews never again worshipped idols. Now, you've only got to go to the Old Testament to see how time and time again God rebuked them for being unfaithful to him for following the, the idolatry introduced into the land, for example, by Jezebel and others later. Time and time again, God accused them of, of, of being unfaithful to him. I, I spoke the other, the other Sunday, I think it was, about Hosea, and Hosea and his relationship with his wife, Gomer, and how that was a picture of God's relationship uh, with Israel. So here... But once they got out of Babylon again and got back to their own country, they never again worshipped idols. So that when John the Baptist came announcing the coming of the Messiah, he didn't have to ask the people to turn away from idols because they didn't worship idols. And when Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, he didn't have to explain to the people which God he was claiming, or rather, uh, which God, uh, uh, he claimed, uh, the Son of, who, of which God he claimed to be, getting tongue-tied. 
And when the, when the Christians went out to preach the gospel for the first time, the gospel of the Son of God, it was straightforward for them. Because the people knew that they, that they came as the, as the ministers of the Son of the God in whom they believed. And by the way, do you know how that came about that they got out? Now the Babylonians did worship many gods as I think you know. Marduk was the chief god, but they had lots and lots of other gods. But what happened to the Babylonian Empire? It was overthrown by the Medes and Persians. And do you know, if you go to Isaiah chapter 44 and Isaiah chapter 45, you will discover that God actually named Cyrus 150 to 160 years before the man was born. And he said that Cyrus is my servant. I have named him though he has not known me. And he said that Cyrus shall open the two leaf gates. And he did. Uh, the army of Cyrus encumbered the city of Babylon, laid siege to it. The Babylonians thought they were safe inside. But Cyrus sent some of his soldiers to divert the course of the river which normally flowed through the city so that there's the dried bed of the river under the, under the wall. And Cyrus sent his men under the, dry, un, under the wall of the city, along the dried bed, and they opened the gates of the city. And in that night Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, was slain, and Darius the Mede reigned in his stead. God raised up Cyrus to be the one to bring his people out of Babylon. And what was the significance of that? Well, the, the Persians, and Cyrus was, was, a, was a, 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 a Persian, were Zoroastrians. And the Zoroastrians worshipped one God, the God of heaven. So they were sympathetic towards the Jews. In fact, when Cyrus came along, uh, the Jewish leaders pointed out to him that he was mentioned in their scriptures. So that pleased him. And he gave them all kinds of concessions. So the moment was right, religiously, because they never worshipped idols again. Secondly, the Babylonian captivity did a tremendous thing in that it created within the people a respect and a love for the study of the Word of God. Now you know that in captivity they had no temple, they had no priesthood, they couldn't offer the sacrifices of the law of Moses, and consequently the leaders of the nation got them together to study the Scriptures and to have fellowship together. And they established the synagogues. The word synagogue means a meeting, a meeting together. And in the synagogue system, they learned to study the scriptures and they learned to love the scriptures. And when they got back out of captivity, got back to their own land, even though the temple was rebuilt, they continued the synagogue system and it spread throughout the Roman world wherever Jews were found. And so much so that when the church was established, the worship of the early New Testament church was patterned on the synagogue prayer and praise and the study of the Word of God and not on the temple. So we've got three blessings there. First of all, we have the fact that the Jews never turned again to idolatry. Secondly, that they learned to love and to study the Word of God. I should have mentioned this, you know. I'd almost forgotten to mention it, but I've got to mention it to you. This business of the study of the Word of God. In New Testament times, the Jews loved the Scriptures. The, the Greek version of the Old Testament was like the King James Version, the authorized version. And, and it's an interesting fact that the, the uh, uh, preachers of the gospel in, in New Testament times had a people who were willing to respect the Word of God when they preached that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. And as I pointed out this morning, there was a constant appeal to the fact that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament. So the time was right chronologically, the time was right religiously, the time was right culturally too. Like all the, all the great empires of the world, there came a time when the, the um, uh, Persian Empire disappeared. It was 
succeeded by the Macedonian Empire. And in that Macedonian Empire, there was one great character whose name the world will never forget. That's Alexander. Alexander the Great. You know, he was a remarkable man. His father was Philip of Macedon. And there is sort of a bit of a suspicion here that Alexander helped his father out of the way, if you know what I mean. He sort of discreetly got rid of him. But Alexander the Great came to power at 24 years of age. And he was more like a meteor than a star. He flashed across the world sky just like a meteor. And in 12 years, that man completely changed the whole course of history. He actually died in Babylon, we believe, of fever and alcoholism, lamenting that there were no more worlds to conquer at 36 years of age. Think about that. But you know, he did an amazing thing for the world. Wherever he went, he took his tutor with him. His tutor was Aristotle, the great philosopher. And wherever like Alexander went, he introduced Greek culture, Greek life, uh, Greek art, Greek literature, Greek architecture, and above everything else, the Greek language. Do you know that after the death of Alexander, Greek became the language of the ancient world? And even in Rome, they didn't speak Latin, they spoke Greek. So, when the first preachers of the gospel came along, they had a language to use. They didn't have to struggle with a thousand different dialects, but wherever they went in the Roman world, they could use the Greek language. And you know, 250 years before Jesus came, the Old Testament scriptures were translated from Hebrew into Greek in Alexandria. That became known as the Septuagint version, based upon the word that means 70, because 70 scholars were used to translate the scriptures into Greek. And that, as I've already said, was the version in common use in New Testament times. In fact, let me tell you this. Every Old Testament quotation that we have in our New Testament today is based on the Greek translation of the Old Testament and not the Hebrew translation. Nobody spoke Hebrew in the days of Jesus. They spoke a dialect called Aramaic, which was a kind of Hebrew. And when the scriptures were read in, in, in their services in the synagogue, the people couldn't understand the Hebrew that was read, and it had to be translated by somebody standing next to the reader. So people read the Greek, New Test the Greek Old Testament. And, and as I say, consequently, when the preachers of the gospel came along and they, they talked to the people about the Lord Jesus Christ, they were able to go to the Greek language that everybody knew. And I suppose uh, that Alexander never expected anything like that. He had not the faintest idea that in giving the Roman world the Greek language, he was preparing the world for the New Testament. Because uh, when Paul wrote to the Romans, he wrote in Greek. When John wrote the Revelation, he wrote in Greek. Every book of the New Testament was written in Greek. Because it was a, a language at the peak of its perfection, Hellenistic Greek, or Koine Greek, as it's commonly known as. Uh, well, the word mean, Koine means common anyway. Uh, that, that was the most beautiful language, so expressive. The, 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 the language that God chose to use for the presentation of his word to the world. Alexander didn't know what was happening, but God was working towards the fullness of time when Jesus would come. And then finally, it was politically the right time as well. Uh, like the other empires, before it the Greek empire gave way to the Romans. That little place, that little collection of mud huts on the banks of the Tiber that goes back to 753 B.C., eventually became the master of the world. I don't know what they teach you about, uh, about the geography of the world in your schools, but in our schools we were always taught that Italy stands out like a boot, like a, like a cowboy boot, I guess you could say, in the Mediterranean. And it looks like a boot, doesn't it? But that, that, that boot 
became the master of the, of, of, of the world in New Testament times. And we don't have the time to discuss their history, but I'll tell you this, some of the things that the Romans did were very grateful for. First of all, they made the ancient world safe for travelers. They wiped out piracy on the Mediterranean, which was rampant. They got rid of, of robbers and outlaws on the roads. They built roads. They were great road builders. And if you ever know anything about Roman roads, there's always one feature about them, and that is they go in a straight line. Whenever the Romans made a road, it was from A to B, the shortest distance between two points. Always a straight line. And they crisscrossed the empire with roads. And on those roads they had soldiers patrolling to make sure that for travelers and for merchantmen the roads were safe. So that when, when the, the first missionaries, the first preachers of the gospel went out on the roads, they were safe. The Romans made the roads safe. They did something else too. The Romans introduced a postal system very much like the Pony Express, would you believe it? That may surprise you, but it's true. It was based upon the Persian model. But that, that postal system instituted by the Romans when, when, when a, a messenger took, took, the, uh, took, took the mail, you might call it, from one, one station to another, well, it, it enabled letters to be sent throughout the empire. That's why Paul was able to use it in sending letters out to the various churches of which we read in the New Testament. And another thing too, the Romans gave the world what was called the Pax Romana, the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. When Jesus was born, there was a time of great tranquility throughout the, the ancient world. And the Romans had a way of indicating that. In Rome, and if you go to Rome today, you'll see the ruins of the temple to Janus. Now Janus was the Roman god with two faces, one at the front, one at the back. He faced two ways. And it's the Roman god Janus who's given us the month, guess what it is? January. And when you think of the position of January, looking forward into the new year, and looking back on the old year, you can understand how appropriate that is. But whenever the Roman Empire was at peace, the temple to Janus was closed. The doors were closed. The, the temple was only open in the time of war. And when Jesus was born, the temple to Janus was closed. That is why Caesar Augustus, in a time of peace, could order a census of the, the whole empire. And that is why Joseph and his betrothed Mary made their way to Bethlehem. And there, while the shepherds looked on in wonder, and the angels chanted the birth of Jesus, that child was born in the fullness of time. God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under law, to redeem them that were under the law. Now, the whole point of what I've said tonight is that all down the ages, God had been preparing for that moment. For the moment we enjoy today, when we have the privilege of the blessings of forgiveness produced for us by that death on the cross of which I spoke this morning. And this is something, you know, that many, many historians don't fully understand. And, and it's one reason why, why many historians never will understand. If they're atheists, they can't explain anything. They can't explain why we're here. They can't really explain where we came from. And they certainly can't explain where we're going. There are many historians 
who have never really understood that history is not a sequence of unrelated events. And that's how many do see history. But God has been and still is at work in his own world. André Marois, the uh, French writer, said, The universe is indifferent. Who created it? Why are we here on this puny mud heap spinning in infinite space? I have not the slightest idea, and I am convinced that no one else has the least idea. Well, Paul could have set that benighted Frenchman right. If the man had only the intelligence to read what the New Testament has to say, and especially that letter to the Ephesians that speaks of God's purpose in the fullness of time, God's had this purpose working all through the ages. And that purpose is set forth in Christ, and that purpose is the unification of all things in himself. And it is still being worked out today. Now, at this very moment, through the gospel, wherever the gospel is preached, and men respond obediently to the message and are baptized into Christ, God's purpose is being achieved for those who respond. And these verses, and I would suggest you read Galatians 4, verses 1 to 4, be quite adequate. These verses ought to be a source of great comfort and great strength to every believer because in the midst of the complexities and the anxieties and problems of our world today, we need the reassurance that God is still on the throne and God is still in charge. Uh, there's a lovely text in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 12, where Jeremiah speaks of a glorious throne set on high from the beginning. God has been on that throne from the beginning. He's never abdicated. He's never left it. He's there right now. May not be seen by us, but he's there and he's working towards the ultimate, to the consummation of that great purpose when the Lord comes back again to claim the people that he's called out for himself. Look, there's a great future in store for the Lord's church and you can be a part of that future when you let God add you to the church in his own way. Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that disbelieves shall be condemned. And if you're subject to God's invitation tonight, go and sing a hymn for your encouragement. Let's stand to sing, Greg. I don't know about tomorrow, I just live from day to day, I don't borrow from its sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry or the future, for I know what Jesus said, and today I'll walk beside him, for he knows what is ahead. I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand every step. Every burden's getting 
lighter. Every cloud is silver light. There the sun is always shining. There no tear will dim the eye. At the sky. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know May be through the flame or flood, but his presence goes before me, and I'm covered with his blood. Many things about to to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sign or a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toll he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but it's best if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of His love. 
until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for those who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way what he says we will do where he sins we will go never fear only trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in jesus but to trust and obey